you can't get into a boat like this and not feel what it was like to, to operate this boat for the country. I owe an awful lot to the Clam Gore as my home for three and a half years. It's a very unique experience. You're, you're a family when you're on a diesel boat. The submarine was probably a turning point in my life. And I trace that all back here to the Clamagore and the people that I served with. Uh, and those people, if it wasn't for them, I probably would have not made it. When you're going out being depth charged and shot at and on dangerous, dangerous missions on a regular basis, you, you have to have that trust. Clamagore is unique because she's a uh, surviving uh, Guppy 3, a complete modification. They change the bow, they enlarge the batteries, propulsion systems, this sail, this piece right here, gets changed. Still the batteries were the, were the handicap. The fact that it had diesels was a handicap. We weren't nuclear. We were ahead of our time. We were a giant hybrid. They're doing everything they can to survive in the heat down here. Well, you know, I'm sweating right now and it's a 85 degree day and the engines are off. There, there's four diesel powered engines with the exhaust stacks that come right up past where we're standing here. If each of these engines was 800 degrees and we're in a closed tube, it's going to be hot as hell down here. Earlier today when I went down on the boat, it just all comes back, you know, it just pours back. The smell for one thing, just smell and the kind of musty smell on the boat. I would go home on a weekend or something and bring my clothes to get washed, and my parents would just hold their nose and throw them and work right in the washer because they stuck so bad from diesel. When you surfaced after 60 or 70 days, the fresh air made you sick. Yeah. The only time we ever took a shower is if we were out for 40 or 50 days, which we thought was pretty good. That was a luxury to have that shower. My mentor told me whenever he left, take his bunk, because it was that one under the torpedo. These bunks up here, if somebody flew out in heavy rolls, they would land on this guy or this guy that was on the outboard, and I was pretty safe back there in the corner. I had that same bunk. Oh, you did? Same bunk. It, it had all kinds of features to it, this bunk. You know, it was a great bunk. In submarines back then, especially, you came aboard as what they called a non-qual. You were not qualified. When you first step aboard, you have no clue. And you had to learn in each compartment what everything, what every single valve and switch did. Because if you're caught in there when there's an emergency, you shut that door, you have to know how to operate everything in there. I had no clue. Finished sub school, and I didn't have time to even do what they were talking about because the fire control person on there said, hey, I'm transferring in three days, so I need to teach you all of this in three days. It went from there. The day after I reported aboard, we left to go on a uh, six-day training mission. And I'm on watch for, you know, four hours, five hours, six hours, seven hours. And I'm getting tired. I figure it's time to go to bed. You know? So I said, I'll see you, John. I'm going to turn in. <laughs> doesn't work that way. You straighten my butt right out quick. Say, no, oh, you're not off watch till midnight. You got another four hours. And that was just the beginning. And from then on, I kind of just snowballed. My job was in the conning tower, so I heard and saw a lot of things that nobody else did. I remember the waves going up over the top of the sail. The lookouts actually had to be tied into the top of the sail, and people to sleep had to be tied into their bunks. Lots of things happened that weren't supposed to happen, and uh, we and we handled them when we were still here, you know, and it's still here. One of my scariest moments when uh, you know, we were down uh, approximately 220 feet. I remember very vividly that a gauge line ruptured and we had flooding in our pump room down below. That made me grow up. It really opened my eyes to what was, what was happening on a submarine. I stood watch back there in maneuvering, and one time we were on watch, we were out at sea, 
running on four engines. And all of a sudden, a big explosion. <laughs> the crankshaft on one of the pistons broke, and it was banging against the hull. It was an emergency. We had to shut down everything, come to all stop, close all the watertight doors, and do all that, because it was a fire. I don't know of anybody that was afraid or scared when that happened. You know, everybody just jumped up and did their job, you know? And you, you've gone through all these possibilities in your head and in your training so you're ready for just about anything to happen. It, that kind of training can carry with you the entire rest of your life. Uh, it, was, it was all second nature. Your hands knew which way to go. I almost could do it now because I, it's muscle memory kind of a thing. You know, you throw them off and you, and you bring it down so the engines are not revving at full power, the motors are not generating the full thing. You throw all these off and then you reverse that lever and then you pull it back on either in serial or, or parallel, one or the other. There's a chart somewhere on the boat that uh, tells you how much time you have left if you're on the bottom and it's minutes and seconds. <laughs> you don't have a whole lot of time. It's a dangerous environment, and you know that, but you put that out of your mind, and you get trained to react to the danger, so you feel confident. It's a unique experience. You're brothers forever. You, you're a brother of the Finn, you know, for life, till you go on eternal patrol. <laughs>